vaccines. And as speaking delegate, we have Ms. Pabita Dhungel. She has done her bachelor in optometry from IOM to UTH. She has also accomplished her master's in vision science from Pacific University, ORUSA. Ms. Pabita is renowned for her academic excellence and expertise. Till today's date, she has got various awards in the international platform for her excellence. They include Zoe and Janet for early career, Cornea and Contact Lens Award by AAU, Beta Sigma Kappa Exceptional Research Award, the Kikuchi Research Scholarship Student Travel Fellowship by AAU. Hello, ma'am. Are you there? Yes. I feel so honored to welcome you here. Thank you so much. Now I think you shall proceed with your presentation. Thank you for the generous introduction. Hello everyone, I am Pavita Dunya and I welcome you all for today's uh, seminar and I will be briefly discussing about the scleral lenses and uh, before I am proceeding, I would like to show some disclaimer. The presentation is the property of the presenter and the Pacific University because most of the clinical photographs that are shown in this presentation are the property of the Pacific University and it is solely intended for the educational purpose and may not be distributed, copied or modified without the expression written consent of the presenter. For today's presentation, I will be briefly going over the few introductions to scleral lenses, the indications of the lenses, clinical complication of the lens wear, and there are various complications of the wear, but among them, I will be briefly discussing more on its impact, of, impact on scleral lenses. So let's proceed and welcome you all. So a scleral lens is a rigid contact lenses that bolts on the cornea and lands on the conjunctival, like, like you can see around in this clinical photograph. And the main purpose of wearing these kind of lenses is it provides the continuous hydration and provides the optical visual correction, op optical visual correction of optimum quality. And it has been used for several ocular surface disease conditions. So historically, the origin of the contact lenses are intrinsically linked to scleral lenses. The first known contact lens fitted to the eye were scleral lenses, and which was around it, uh, which was around early um, late uh, 1800s. The first publication of the literature of the contact lens were uh, given by Adolf Pick in 1888. It's quite surprising. So in, during those days, the scleral lenses were made up of the glass material. As um, the previous presenter a couple of days back, uh, Dr. Arnold gave his uh, short documentary video on how scleral lenses were manufactured back then. So I will not be discussing much on the historical aspect of it. Again, so with the introduction of the soft contact lenses a few years after, the scleral lenses, they were overshadowed by, or let's say nearly extinct from the market. However, uh, in the past few years, more companies have entered the scleral contact lens market, as this is because of its good uh, visual quality in the conditions where the visual correction cannot be performed by uh, conventional contact lenses, such as soft contact lenses, or even the RGP lenses in most of the cases. And on the top of that, um, it provides the optimum comfort, uh, not like in uh, traditional small diameter RGP lenses. Um, optimally, the um, DK value, we all uh, know the belief that higher the DK value, better will be the comfort. And, uh, the previous contact lens uh, when that were manufactured in the earlier days were uh, PMMA, which is polyhydroxymethylmethyl acrylate. So with the um, uh, advancement of the material, the first FDA-approved uh, scleral lens material 
were manufactured by Boston Scleral Lens in 1994 with the material gas permeable material silicon acrylate polymer. Since then, uh, the material has been evolving, uh, let's say, every year, every month, and so on. So the traditional conventional uh, diameter that has been um, constantly evolving from 15.5 to 23 mm, and it depends on various conditions we feed them. Um, initially, the scleral lens were classified uh, based on the diameter, but uh, currently there are a few modifications made by scleral lens uh, society. And on a, if until uh, contraindicated otherwise, the traditional or most of the um, scleral lenses that are commercially available are of the decay value around 100. Um, this uh, particular and diagram, diagram depicts the shape of the corneal curvature and the scleral curvature, uh, scleral curvature of the normal human eye and the scleral lens on the top of that. So the ideally the large diameter of the scleral lens uh, enable, enables to it to entirely vault on the cornea, thereby uh, creating the artificial tear behind the tear behind the lenses, and uh, it the Ideal a corneal vault zone is 250 to 400 micron, which I will be discussing in the further slide why we have to choose or be more careful when you are uh, selecting the um, central vault. And then these all other parameters such as peripheral lift zone, uh, uh, zone over here, and then the limbal lift zone and scleral landing zone can be modified on various condition depending on the toricity of the sclera or after feeding the diagnostic scleral lenses. This is the anterior segment uh, OCT a photograph of the uh, similar. So this is the anterior view uh, and the cl uh, slit lamp clinical photograph of the scleral lens wear, while this is the corneal section, uh, corneal section and it shows the different landing area of the scleral, scleral lens, just like shown in the previous slide. And this is the comparison of the uh, scleral lens wear on the eye versus the OCT image of the uh, same lens wear. The small green gap lit over here, shown with the fluorescent pattern, is the tear lens, which is right um, behind the lens and in front of the cornea, which is ideally should be around 300 micron. We can uh, uh, roughly estimate the uh, tear volume or let's say the clearance in comparison to the corneal thickness as well as, and the first first surface is the contact lens thickness in which uh, this, uh, this lens was 300 micron. And this is the ideal, uh, optimal feeding of the scleral lens web uh, from the perspective of the clearance. This is the whole, uh, this picture, this photograph shows the um, ideal contact lens feeding. This surface of the, this front surface is the uh, scleral lens, while this gap between the back of the lens and front of the cornea is the clearance, while this is the cornea. This is just the anterior segment photograph of the scler of the eye with the lens on it. So coming to the indications of the um, scleral lenses, the primary indication of the scleral lens is to provide the optimal visual correction in irregular corneal astigmatism as well as in various ocular surface diseases. So um, on uh, Irregular astigmatism, there are some of them are naturally occurring, while some of them are artificially induced by trauma or some surgery method or some disease process. So the main uh, cause of the irregular astigmatism that happens naturally are due to keratoconus, pellucid uh, marginal degeneration, and keratoglobus. And among the irregular astigmatism, most of them are induced by uh, corneal uh, or let's say uh, ocular injury, uh, more focused on corneal trauma, post-keratoplasty, 
and post-refractive surgery such as radial keratectomy, uh, PRK, and LASIK. While some of the astigmatism is also induced after the um, infections like herpes and the simplex virus and herpes twister uh, virus infection as well. Other than that, it is also indicated in various athletics and also in the cases where the traditional GP lenses fails due to rocking issues. So the, th these are just the uh, photographs of the various ir irregular astigmatism that is naturally occurring, such as keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, and the keratoglobus. Similarly, surgically induced irregular astigmatism or irregular cornea, such as in post LASIK or post LASIK ectasia and post RK, uh, post um, penetrating keratoplasty, and even uh, intracorneal rings. And also due to post herpetic simplex or even post uh, teresiums. Similarly, um, long term uh, penetrating injury and post corneal mild abrasions, and even after the healing of the corneal ulcer, it might lead to irregular corneal shapes. Similarly, in irregular cornea is also caused due to various dystrophies and degenerations, um, which we may not see in uh, routine practice generally, but also Salzman nodular degeneration, Therian's marginal degeneration, lattice dystrophy, and uh, corneal granular dystrophy. So the main uh, goal of the scleral lens prescribing is to um, support the ocular surface uh, ocular surface by maintaining the constant corneal lubrications and it also maintain the corneal protection and also in cases of various degrees of dry eye ranging from mild to severe cases um, the first goal of uh, prescribing scleral lenses in ocular surface disease is pain attenuation because it provides uh, the constant corneal hydration and it prevents uh, less drying out of the eyes uh, in between the blinks and it's not ideally possible for uh, any people to constantly use the dro lubricating drops and scleral lens might ease out that as well um, and also prevents from uh, photophobia. So this is just uh, some pictures I pulled out of the internet with those uh, previous scleral lenses, whereas after the scleral lens feeling, how happy the patient is. And we all want happy patients. And how does it work basically for the ocular surface protection is because of its large diameter, it covers the cornea. And on a normal clinical setting, uh, we have been feeding 15.5 to 16.5 mm diameter of the scleral lenses. Uh, whereas we all, most of the cases, the soft lenses are 14.2 to 14.6 mm in diameter, depending on the brand or the um, whether they are toric soft lenses or the uh, spherical soft lenses. And it also prevents from recurrent corneal erosion. It provides shield during the blinking. And it also works as a therapy for persistent epithelial defects. Um, so whenever any patient, when they come for a scleral lens, uh, wear or various condition, their main goal, they think, uh, or they think is the main goal of wearing the scleral lens is achieving 20-20 vision, which may not be the case always. And also, it is not curative because it's just like wearing glasses. When you wear glasses, you see clearly, and when you don't wear them or when you take them off, it's again your same vision uh, without the glasses. So, scleral lens is something like that. It is uh, not curative, it is just rehabilitative, and it, uh, it, also, it also helps in some conditions of the um, corneal dry eye issue, but it does not completely eliminate the use of the artificial tears or the supplementary lens. 
and um, we should provide and uh, this concept to the patients who come from uh, who come for scleral lens feed feeding. And there might be there are various pathological uh, conditions which uh, which causes various ocular surface disease, and I will not be explaining all of them, but I'll try to cover them as much as possible in today's presentation. Uh, first, uh, we'll go to Stephen Johnson syndrome, and it is, uh, most of us are, uh, should be familiar with this condition. I hope many of us are. And it is a rare and serious um, disorder of the skin and the mucous membrane, which is uh, usually caused by allergic reactions to some medications, but it is not only limited to medication, but also can be caused by um, infections uh, like mycoplasma pneumonia, or can also be caused by um, vaccination and other conditions. So th there are uh, various manifestations of this disease not limited to eye only and some of them are acute conjunctivitis and peeling of the skin on pressure such as shown over here and discoloration of the skin and nail disfigurement um, lip um, lip margin and dermalization over here and uh, extra row of uh, eyelashes might grow and the mortality rate is one to five percent in the cases of Stephen Johnson syndrome. So this was the case um, that me along with my professor uh, saw in Pacific University. The patient had uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome and his initial vision was uh, 2400. We can see the severe chemosis around here, the corneal haze, and uh, the panus formation around entire the cornea and most of the cases it might be due to corneal hypoxia and after the six months of the scleral lens where the patient had 2020 vision where we can see the most of the corneal haze is gone and the cornea has healed properly or let's say even better let's say better and the chemosis around the conjunctiva is gone even the uh, panus formation is also decreased. So, uh, Stephen Johnson in uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome, and the scleral lens uh, are proven to. There are various studies which uh, which have shown that scleral lens are um, one of the main one of the main uh, method of uh, corneal healing. And uh, this is also the another condition for um, various corneal epithelial defects, corneal debris, prior to scleral lenses, and after two months of the scleral lens, where the cornea has healed much better. And the other condition, ocular surface uh, disease condition, is cicatricial pempigoid. It is one of the autoimmune disease in which the WBC of the own body attacks the um, and own body attacks the body and then they act and the antibodies are formed. So and this leads to formation of various uh, bullets and lesions in the skin and the mucous membrane which results in formation of the scars and affect the um, tissues in skin, conjunctiva and other mucous membrane. It is. It also leads to formation of uh, severe conjunctival scarring, a recurrent uh, uh, inflammation, and symbleferon, which is the uh, adhesion of the leads with the conjunctiva, or even ankylobleferon in a severe condition, which is adherent of the two eyelid condition, which leads to difficulty in eye movement and in worse conditions leads to corneal ulcerations as well if they are not treated for a long period of the time. The similar um, ocular surface disease is graft versus host disease and this is immune mediated disease due to complex interactions between the donor and the recipient immu immunity after the transplant in most of the cases is due to bone marrow transplant. There are two types of graft versus host disease. One is acute, which happens after in less than 
after after less than 100 days of the transplant, where while chronic form, they happen after greater than or more than 100 days. And um, in uh, the cases of graft versus host disease, um, ocular manifestation happens in 60 to uh, 40 to 60 percent of uh, um, allergenic stem cell transplant conditions. And onset of the ocular um, graft versus host disease varies from weeks to years, and it usually affects the skin, liver, gastrointestinal tracts, uh, and mucosa. And the most common manifestation, ocular manifestation, is dry eye disease, which affects 60 to 90 percent of the cases. So this one case uh, is um, the cases of graft versus host disease. I, I try to make the name anonymous over here. And it is prior to the feeding of the uh, scleral lens where you can see the corneal staining in the right and left eye when the patient has suffered from graft versus host disease. And the, immediately after the wearing of the scleral lens for five hours, and the patient had huge improvement in the ocular surface and the surface regularity. The, it, the, it is not the direct ocular, uh, it does not cause the direct ocular surface disease, but in a long term, um, Bell's palsy leads to ocular surface. Manifest, one of the manifestations is ocular surface disease. And Bell's palsy is uh, uh, mononeuropathic, paralysis of the cranial nerve seven, which is facial nerve. And most of the cases, it is unilateral, while bilateral condition is uh, rarely, it happens rarely. And it is, um, the paralysis happen, the cranial seventh nerve emerges from the bones of the brain stem, and it controls the muscles of the facial expression, um, function of the uh, taste, uh, as its nerve ending happens in anterior to third of the tongue. So in most of the cases, it is idiopathic and the incidence is uh, 20 per 100,000 population. Mm. And 60 to 80% of the cases result by itself. Um, the ocular manifestation mostly occurs uh, as a form of inability to close or blink the eye and decreased uh, or absent lacrimation and atropine. Similar, uh, another um, form that leads to uh, ocular surface disease is acoustic neuroma. Uh, it is a vestibular sonoma um, that happens in cranial nerve eight seat, and it compresses the cranial nerve eight uh, within the internal auditory canal. If the tumor is larger than 2.5 centimeter, uh, it compresses the uh, cranial nerve fifth, seventh as well. Sorry for the type over here. And 2,000 to 3,000 people suffer from acoustic neuroma annually, and between the they, the age range is between 30 to 60 years. It is a life-threatening uh, condition if it is not treated in time, as if the tumor grows in size, it cre creates a uh, um, disease known as hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, and it is life-threatening situation. Um, bilateral acoustic neuroma is also associated with uh, neurofibromatosis type 2. So the, here we can uh, see the large, uh, how the seventh facial nerve, seventh nerve, the cranial nerve seventh yeah, is closely related to the uh, vestibular canal over here, and it is the uh, large size acoustic neuroma. And the main method of uh, tre main treatment modality for acoustic neuroma is surgical excision. And uh, du during the surgical excision, it might uh, affect the cranial nerve seven, which is closely present hereby, and lead to uh, other form of. Uh, other form of uh, ocular surface diseases. So all these conditions that I mentioned in the previous uh, slides, such as um, the 
acoustic neuroma and uh, uh, Bell's palsy. The most common ocular manifestation is exposure keratopathy, uh, which in a long or extreme and long standing uh, corneal exposure, either from the mechanical or the neurogenic uh, um, lead paralysis, may lead to the dehydration of the cornea and, in worst cases, even might um, cause the persistent epithelial defects of the cornea, corneal ulceration, and even the perforation. So if, the, if these cases are um, treated in time uh, with the prevention of the ocular surface with the scleral lenses, we might be still able to uh, preserve the cornea. And in these cases need to be monitored very closely. And it is not that the scleral lens uh, are prescribed only in special conditions, as I mentioned earlier. It can be also prescribed in uh, other normal cornea, such as in high amitropia, high astigmatism, in cases of aphakia, and during the sports. Given that there are so many advantages and uses of the scleral lenses, it is not uh, without the complications or uh, disadvantages uh, per se. Um, the main uh, measure of the complications that scleral lens wear, um, wearer might face is surface deposit and lens settling, which I will be describing a uh, few minutes after. And the conjunctival compression, it might also interact with the uh, pingicula, which might lead to constant irritation of the eye uh, or even discontinuation of the lens. And like the traditional RGP lenses, and these also might ca cause um, giant papillary conjunctivitis, uh, tear film fogging, and the application bubbles. In this clinical photograph, we can see the huge bubble over here. Um, it's slightly towards the nasal side and it is away from the visual axis, but it might move around and it uh, causes the um, um, decrease in vision if it is in the central visual axis. So it's uh, very easy to get rid of this problem just by removing the lenses and reapplication of the lenses and the bubble is gone. So, like I said earlier, this, uh, it is here we can see the uh, clearance between the back surface of the lens uh, to the front uh, and the front surface of the cornea, which is typically 200 to 400 micron. Um, why we have to choose the higher clearance is because in most of the cases, the studies have shown studies have shown that. Uh, um, the lens will settle uh, after the prolonged period of wearing. So from the this was one of the studies that was conducted in Pacific University by my professor uh, Patrick Caroline. I'm really very grateful for him um, because he provided all these interesting cases and the clinical photographs. So, uh, the initial baseline clearance for the scleral lens wear uh, was kept at, at 400 micron, and um, they were constantly measuring the um, clearance every 30 minutes, one hour, two hour, four hours, six hours, and eight hours. So it was constantly decreasing. Uh, so in 30 minutes, it was 340 micron. In one hour, it was still sustained to 340 micron. In uh, two hours, it was 320 micron, and it started slowly decreasing. And in six hours, it was 270 micron. And in eight hours, it was uh, maintained to 270 micron. So this was just one case, and they, the average uh, corneal uh, clearance that was found in the scleral lens, where on a normal feeding was 130 microns. So if it is, if the clearance is less even from the beginning, 
and then it might cause uh, corneal hypoxia, tightening of the lenses in the periphery. The patient might feel the edge of the lenses, and uh, in a long term, it might cause other forms of the complications. So this is uh, and. Uh, inadequate peripheral corneal clearance as you can see the interaction of the edge of the lens to the front surface of the cornea around the limbal zone while the we can uh, it, uh, we don't need to have it's it's always ideal to have an oct and see the clearance if it is possible which is not feasible in every clinical setting so we can evaluate uh, that with the uh, slit lamp uh, using the cobalt blue ratin filter and the fluorescent pattern over here. While we can clearly see how the limbal, uh, limbus is compressed over here, while in APRO, this is not the ideal case. So we have to refit the lenses, uh, maybe increase the um, sagittal depth of the lenses, or let's say increase the diameter of the lenses. And uh, addressing those issues will. Uh, need another presentation, which I will not be able to cover today. So, grossly on clinical setting, we just need to look at the peripheral part of the limbus to rule out whether we have uh, adequate uh, peripheral corneal clearance or not, because prolonged, uh, prolonged form of inadequate clearance might lead to corneal hypoxia. Similarly, this is not a huge issue uh, in clinical setting, but uh, in many of the cases, it is still unknown what causes this form of the conjunctival uh, prolapse. A uh, few of the hypotheses that says the negative uh, pressure or the force or the suction of the scleral lens holding the lens uh, for a long period of the time might cause the loosening of the tissue and uh, lead, leads to conjunctival prolapse. The conjunctival prolapse might also add to the cornea in severe cases. It is usually uh, occurring inferior part of the cornea, but necessarily it does not have to always be there. It can occur 360 degree. And most of the cases, it might be due to usually uh, forceful insertion of the lenses. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have fitted the scleral lenses, but if you are feeding the scleral lenses, we usually ask the patient to pull their lower lid down and they will feel the lens first on the uh, lower part of the conjunctive or lower limbus. That's where the initial pressure happens. And that might be one of the potential cause while the, why the conjunctival prolapses on the inferior cornea. And, and uh, it might cause irritation to the eye leading to, uh, leading to the fogging and most of the patient uh, in the initial days uh, uh, face the midday fogging during the scleral lens wear. So these are a few of the common complications, or uh, let, let's say the common problems that we encounter during the scleral lens wear. And most of us uh, might be familiar with this, but I would like to describe more on um, one of the hot topic of scleral lens these days, which is the impact of scleral lens wear on IOP. So let me get, go back to a few slides. Uh, uh, like I was showing all these uh, landing zone of this edge of the scleral lens on the limbus. Um, so when the scleral lens land on the limbus and throughout the day, like uh, it was settling down, it compresses the limbal area and the limbus is the main ocular uh, ocular uh, the whole uh, the limbal, limbal area is where all the angle structures are present and due to prolonged uh, scleral lens wear the, the, the weight of the lens and the suction of the lens might compromise the angle structure where the scleral lens land and it is proposed to be one of the cause or the increase in IOP of the eye after the scleral lens wear. I will briefly be describing about the anatomy of the eye and the IOP. So, acute is produced in the ciliary body over here in this 
excuse me, in the ciliary body and the drain, drainage routine is from of the aqueous humor flows from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber through the pupil. And from the anterior chamber, it exits the eye through the trabecular mesoarch and into the sclerotic canal. So, uh, like I was showing earlier in many slides, we know that the edge of the scleral lens land right around here, the limbus compressing all these angle structures. And there have been, uh, there has not been any solid study or le let's say meta-analysis of this study. Um, which shows that in scleral lens wear might cause increasing IOP, but a couple of the studies that have been out, uh, some of them say they have not, it does not cause increase in IOP, while some say uh, it causes increase in IOP. This is one of the studies that I found uh, published in Eye and Contact Lens Volume. They were studying the intraocular pressure after two hours of small diameter scleral lens wear. And the 29 participants um, who did not have any prior history of ocular surface disease or any other eye conditions were treated with square lens uh, 15 mm in a diameter. And they were wearing those lenses for two hours. And the intraocular pressure was uh, measured immediately um, prior to the insertion of the lenses and immediately after the removal of the lenses. So they, they did not find uh, any uh, changes in intraocular pressure within two hours of the lens wear in a normal healthy eye conditions. So similarly, this is another study that was published in uh, contact lens and the interior eye in which they studied the impact of the intraocular pressure, impact of the scleral lens wear, and they were comparing two different uh, diameters among 21 participants, average is 24 years. They were comparing 15.8 diameter versus um, 18 mm diameter of the scleral lenses, uh, which were of exactly the same thickness, same material and design. And, and they also, they were measuring the um, IOP with a transpalpable device known as a diatom. Um, in one of my studies, I was also using this device to measure the intraocular pressure. Uh, I, I will need to, I will, it is still in the uh, post-production for the publication, so I will not be including those slides here today. And in, in their study, they found that you know, while comparing two different diameter of the scleral lens, 15.8 versus 18 mm of uh, scleral lenses, they found that average increase in IUP was five millimeters of the mercury, regardless of the diameter of the lens they were wearing. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, you are welcome. Thank you, ma'am, for such an in informative session. And thanks to all the attendees for the patience as well. Anyone has any question? Now we'll go ahead and take some time for questions. So there's a question from Ananta Powdell. What is the mechanism of healing corneal surface disease after application of Scleral contact lens and any difference between healing on scleral contact lens and therapeutic contact lens. Thank you for the question. The uh, like I mentioned in the my, uh, the earlier slides, the main mechanism of uh, healing of the scleral lens is as the scleral lens. When you are feeding the scleral lens, it, it is fitted with um, some saline or other solution, and it is preserved in uh, preserved in the lens or in between the surface behind the lens and in front of your eye, which provides the constant hydration. And that is one of the main uh, mechanism for healing the ocular surface in disease with the scleral lenses. And then
Uh, okay, I guess there is no more question. So if anybody want to ask the question or want to talk with the Ms. Pavita, so you can un unmute yourself and proceed with the question. Seems like, seems like we don't have any more questions. Uh, uh, if anyone is willing to ask me any other questions or concern, uh, you can read. There is a question from my email address. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, which material is based for uh, scalar contact lens? Um, uh hello dr pavita are you there Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, I, I'm here. I'm back. Your your sound is not audible to us. Okay, you can proceed. There is two question. Uh, should okay. uh, should I read out? Yes, please go ahead. So there is one question from the Basanta. Uh, thank you so mm -hmm. much, sir, for your for your question. And he is asking for what material is the best for uh, square contact lens. Um, various companies are uh, using uh, different materials. It, it is not like uh, one material is uh, best versus the other. They all have their own um, benefits. Usually, um, the uh, Contamac material and Boston XO by Boston Lomb and uh, Optimum Extra, again, by Contamac, they all have higher DK values and they are the usually material. They are the usual brand of the clear lens that we have been feeding in our practice over here. So I, I would say Boston XO2, which is by Boston Lam, which has DK of 141, and uh, again uh, Optimum Extra by Contamac. Those are the material I would say. Those are good. Okay. And so any questions. Uh, yes, yes. There is one expected question from the Ram Sasser. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, for such a question. So he's asking for, in case of increasing the intraocular pressure, what precautions mm -hmm. should, uh, should be uh, taken to prescribe the scleral contact lens? As the study shows, scleral contact lens increase the intraocular pressure. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Uh, so in case of uh, increase in IOP. The study that I recently conducted and is in the verge of uh, publication, we found that there was average increase of uh, 10 millimeters of the mercury, 10 millimeter mercury of IOP from the baseline in scleral lenses, where which is a uh, huge increase from the baseline. So just one time increase in IOP may not have the huge impact. Uh, so if the patients are wearing the scleral lens with for eight hours per, per day and uh, for a long period of time, prolonged increase in IOP uh, might have some impact on them. So what um, we would do is monitor the pressure of the patient uh, uh, on every visit, they visit you for the scleral lens. And uh, constantly along with uh, um, monitoring the pressure, we would also look for other signs of uh, glaucoma if there is any, such as let's say changes in retinal non fiber layer thickness or changes in uh, vertical versus horizontal disc size or uh, angle structures uh, in the consequent follow ups. Those are the um, parameters I would look more into if I'm feeding with scleral lens. Okay, okay. I hope so. That, yeah. uh, yes, yes, uh, it's helped us. So uh, I have a query as well. Like, 
in the case of uh, who is uh, in which category of glaucoma, either in uh, tensive glaucoma or normal tensive glaucoma or POG, whose type of glaucoma uh, we can use the scar lens as a treatment. I mean, which, uh, no, which category of glaucoma types helps the uh, scleric contact lenses? Um, so, uh, as of today, um, there has not been any uh, published paper which says that scleral uh, lens wear causes glaucoma because glaucoma is a chronic condition and there are various other confounding factors. Uh, so, some of the studies, they have already we have shown that there is association of high myopia with the glaucoma and um, there is age factor. So it is not that just the scleral lens wear causes uh, some form of the glaucoma. Uh, you can, um, you need to, like I said earlier, you need to monitor the IOP and other uh, factors. And um, uh, I would still look at the angle structures and pre at least uh, have a baseline uh, OCT and uh, the IOP before I fit the scleral lens wear. Okay, thank you so much. So there is another question from the Ayush Chandan. Thank you so much for your question, Ayush. So he's asking for what minimum thickness of cornea should be considered while uh, uh, scleral lens fitting. That is, uh, that is a very good question. Um, what I would like to say on that particular topic is, uh, it is more uh, not only limited to the you know, corneal, central corneal thickness. Uh, I, the no, normal central corneal thickness is uh, 550 micron. And uh, it is more uh, dependent on uh, the endothelial cell density rather than just the corneal thickness. So, uh, and endothelial uh, cell density, it also is affected by various conditions such as post cataract surgery or um, it is reduced with the age factor or penetrating keratoplasty. Um, if we have that in a normal setting or if after feeding the scleral lens and patients are constantly coming back with um, corneal swelling in those conditions, I would look into the endothelial cell density rather than just on the central thickness. Okay, uh, thank you, doctor. So there is a question from the Farida Khalid. So uh, she is asking for the in case of high extremism, uh, who is contact lens, uh, which contact lens is better, either RGP, soft toric, or scleral lenses? Mm. So that that is again uh, more of um, uh, person to person, uh, dependent on how much is the astigmatism, whether um, uh, whether the patient is uh, uh, comfortable wearing the soft lens versus RGP versus the scleral. Uh, there need to be um, other few other tests, and it is again dependent on the patients as well. If it is if it is more of a if it is more of a greater than uh, two diopter of uh, corneal astigmatism, and the patient if the patient has less than two diopter of the uh, corneal astigmatism and patient is first time. Uh, lens where uh, we can still feed them with uh, uh, toric soft lenses. While uh, some of the patients, even if they have one diopter of uh, corneal astigmatism, they want to go for um, RGP lenses, which is totally dependent on person to person. Okay. okay and so. Yes, yes, there is a, uh, another question. Uh, Ria, can you read out the question? Yes, there is a question from Ram Saha. Thank you for the question. The question is, does long wearing soft contact, uh, scleral contact lens can cause uh, corneal edema? Uh, this is again uh, an amb ambiguous statement because some of the studies they say that the scleral lens wear, uh, scleral lens wear causes hypoxia, while some of the studies say 
it reduces hypoxia. So there has not been fixed conclusion, but what I can see on this question is if there is, um, like I showed in my previous um, presentation, if there is uh, less clearance and it is more interacting in the limbal area, uh, it might be just for two hours or the two hours to four hours might cause uh, corneal edema and the degree of edema also varies and it all it is also dependent on the material and the decay value of the scleral lens that you are wearing okay now other questions you can uh, reach out to me in the email and I will leave my email address to uh, Mr. Kapil and uh, get with the further questions. Thank you ma'am for your replies. I would like to ask uh, you for uh, some few good notes or feedback for our platform. Yeah, I, I am very proud of you, uh, the people who are hosting this because uh, we all are uh, trapped because of COVID-19 and all of us are facing uh, various problems, but uh, knowledge cannot be hindered or uh, it cannot be um, prevented from sharing because of the platform like this. So I'm really very thankful to you and thank you for uh, inviting me to give a talk, the topic I'm interested in. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, okay, I'd uh, like to request oh, you. you all to drop your valuable reviews and feedback in the review file and the link which is available in the chat box. Okay, here we are. So uh, once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pavita, for time and effort. And you have, you are really spoken, reflecting your insights so beautifully. It was inspiring for us. And well, it was already night there. Uh, have a, uh, yeah, have a rest and good night. <laughs> It is almost 11.30 p.m. for me, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending the seminar. Have a good, have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night, Didi. Good night. Thank you so much, Ria. Most welcome. Thank you so much for all the participants. We've been here for around one, one hour and 30 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh,